All right, if you all would, let's all open up our Bibles to the book of 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now we are going to take a little pause break from, uh, from the study of Calvinism. We left off on, um, left off on Calvinism. We got through their tulip system. We got through TU. We'll, we'll tackle limited atonement and irresistible grace and perseverance of the saints. We'll, we'll tackle them another day. I wanted to go back, um, bring, it, bring it back down to some milk for this evening. and um, I just want to just preach on are you saved? That's all I want to talk about. I want to talk about are you saved? So first off, let's open up our Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And I'm going to look at one of the most important passages in all the Bible. And when I say the Bible, I'm talking about the King James Bible. I'm not talking about any of the knockoff perversions, the NIV, the ESV. Go pick your, pick your poison, really, so to say. You know, I'm a firm believer in absolute truth. And I believe if there's one single error in this book, well, we might as well forget about it, throw it away. We're wasting our time. What are we doing here? You know, how could, how could any Christian at all stand behind the pulpit and say, you know, I'm preaching the truth, the truth. We have the truth, you know. Yet, when you pin them down and say, well, which Bible is, which Bible is the truth? An absolute statement. And they say, ah, you know, every, every Bible got errors in it and stuff. That's not, that's not the case. The King James Bible is the pure, preserved Word of God. God inspired His Word. And if you had the power to inspire it, no doubt that he had the power to preserve it. They go hand in hand. And the reason why Christians are so confused, there's so many different teachings out there, it's, it's, I try to keep things very simple. I try to keep things, I'm a very practical guy, I try to keep things down to earth, good old common sense theology. I believe in common sense theology. And uh, what that is, is, um, is, 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 you know, you have to have absolute truth. You have to believe in that there's no error in this book and you get into the whole thing of, well, it's either Jesus Christ lied when he said his words are going to pass away or his words didn't pass away and they're contained in the King James Bible. I don't want to get on a whole historical lesson. I, um, reading a good book, I'm thinking about preparing a study on how we got our King James Bible coming from the English translations um, like William Tyndale and a couple of historical things. Some, some people might find it interesting. I'm getting a lot of blessings from the book. So I'm We'll, we'll get to that eventually, but um, I want to look at the gospel because, like I said, if there's, if there's an error in this book, well, then how do we know there's not an error in our way of salvation? It's pretty, you know, pretty common sense there. But look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Look at verse number 1. It says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you. This is the Apostle Paul writing, okay, and this is the gospel. And it's sad that, you know, you ask uh, most Christians off the street or whatever that, hey, wh what is the gospel? And that's always a, a thing that, you know, when I get, before I get into bickerings and arguings with people and stuff, first off, I want to see, are you saved? Okay, that's the question we're going to be looking at tonight. You know, tell me how to get saved. You got to know that. What is the gospel? I mean, if people think of the gospel, they think, oh, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, or just, you know, you know gospel music or whatever. No, this is, a, this is a passage you ought to be familiar with. This is a passage that contains what saves you, in a sense here. Look at it. Look at more. It says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. Paul declares it. It's the declaration of the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved. That's what I want to look at tonight. Are you saved? By which also ye are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed... In vain. No such thing of believing in vain. All right, believing in vain, you come across the passage over there to verse 14. If Christ be not risen, then are preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. All right, and then he goes on in verse 17, flip a page, verse 17. If Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. So this is how Paul talks. He's always, he's always like talking in a hypothetical sense, you know, because some of these Corinthians are saying, well, there is no resurrection. Okay, there's no resurrection. We could believe Jesus Christ, he might have been a good guy. He might have been, a, you know, had some good teachings and stuff, but he might have died for our sins, died for a good cause, but he didn't really resurrect from the dead. Well, you can't, the gospel is a threefold thing. You have to believe it. And it's interesting how God always works in threes, too, you know. Uh, he died for our sins. Let's look at it. Come to 1 Corinthians 15, verse 2. Unless you believed in vain. There's such thing as believing in vain. All right. And, and, I, and I, you could take it two ways. What is vain? What is some, uh, when you think of somebody that's a vain person, what do you think of? You think of vanity. 
you think of somebody that's just so concerned about themselves, self-centered, narcissistic, egotistical, all those, you know, words and stuff. They're just so focused on themselves. You know, they, they always put, they're so quick to point the glory back to themselves rather than of God. And God set up salvation so that we cannot boast, okay? So unless you believe in vain, that's another way to look at it is people that just believe in themselves. Believing in vain, I believe in myself. Well, that's a bunch of vanity. But over there in the book of Ecclesiastes, it says, a man at his best state is altogether vanity. Ain't that something? Ain't that a pretty, ain't that a, a, a kick right in the gut to, to man? A, a man at his best state is altogether vanity. You know, you could build buildings and have big money and all this money and, and have all the wealth in the world and stuff. And yet it's, it's vanity that don't save you. Look at verse 3. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins. Now look at this. According to the Scriptures. Now that's why it's a big emphasis on why you have to hold up high the Scriptures. Do we have the perfect Word of God? I'm not talking about a translation or eh, it's good enough, it's close enough. I don't want that. I want the Scriptures. Okay? And yes, we do have the Scriptures. Thank, thank the Lord for it. Okay, Christ died for our sins. Now, I always like that word, how he died. How did he die? He shed his blood for us. He died for our sins according to the scriptures. It's not according to what, you know, the media says, what, how you were raised, what your church tells you, your pastor. It has to be according to the scriptures. It has to line up with the book. Now, interesting. I think that's something Christ died for our sins. What is that? That's negative. Okay, he was buried. That's negative. And then he rose again the third day. Okay, there's some positive. There's something positive. Okay, so the gospel, when you think of it, is two-thirds negative. Two-thirds negative. You know, people are, are, are so quick to preach, well, for God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, you know. Yeah, that's, that's you know, that's like a, um, like, a, like a capstone statement of the general idea of it, but that's not the gospel itself. The gospel is Christ died for our sins and was buried, and then He rose again the third day. Okay, so there's some negativity associated with it, and He died for our sins. You've got to acknowledge that we're sinners. And then he was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. All right? That's the gospel. Then we're going to look at some dispensational things for, you know, for you theologians and Bible students and stuff like that. We're going to get into a little, couple little heavier things. Uh, but let's look at Mark. Look at the book of Mark, gospel of Mark. Now, what, what these are, the go this is the, you know, the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. These are the gospels according to Matthew, Mark, and, and, you know, and John. Okay? Now, if you're not familiar, we're going to, you have to see, you see this whole timeline up here and stuff like that. People look at this and think it's, you know, it's crazy, but it's really not. It's really simple to understand. You look at that, okay, way back here, here's Adam. Next thing you know, they partook of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And then they, their eyes were open and everybody did wickedness and God had to flood the world. There's Noah. Next thing you know, after the flood, they, they made a government. They tried to build a big tower up in the heaven, the Tower of, of Babel. God confounded the languages. You got a guy named Nimrod. He was rolling the whole entire world. He was a one-world roller. That's going to, that's gonna, history repeats itself over in this time period. You keep going through that, and got, God calls a man named Abraham. And the, then the Jews get under, un, uh, in slavery for 430 years under Egypt. Then God raises up a deliverer named Moses. Moses gets the, uh, gets the Jews. He, he gets them out of Egypt under the bondage of Pharaoh, and they get into the wilderness, and then guess what? Then God gives a certain, certain laws, statutes, judgments, ordinances, customs, morally, ceremonial, um, social, all kinds of rules and regulations. It's called the law. People think of the law, they think of Ten Commandments. There's, there's a, read the book of Leviticus, Deuteronomy. There's 613 of those of the law, of what you got to do. If you do this, then if you, if you do this, then do this. If you don't do this, then do this. And they go hand in hand. It's not just thou shalt not, but if somebody does do that, well, there's punishment for it. That's why when you look under the law, there's capital punishment for things. Capital punishment for committing adultery. Capital punishment for murder. Um, you know, um, what else? Capital, capital punishment for breaking the Sabbath day. You imagine that? That's why we're not under the law no more. If you imagine if, if you broke the Sabbath day and you kindled a fire, if you started your car and started a, that, that spark, your spark plug or whatever that made that combustion, you, you know, in a sense, you kindled a fire in a sense. You can't drive nowhere. You know, you imagine if somebody, you know, oh, we believe in a Sabbath day. Well, if you believe in a Sabbath day, why, if somebody's disobeying it, why aren't you killing them? You've got to fulfill the whole law, you know. That's, a, that's crazy. 
Anyways, they get themselves under the law. Okay, next thing you know, John the Baptist shows up. What's the point of him? He's, the, he's, the, he's a voice crying out in the wilderness, make way, you know, make, make the path straight and acknowledge that, you know, Israel, you're about to, your, your king's about to come. Your Messiah is about to come. You better get right with God. You better repent, confess your sins, clean up, get things in order because your king's about to come, okay? He points everybody to Jesus Christ. What happens? Jesus Christ dies for our sins. He was buried. He rose again the third day. Next thing you know, you got this time period. You got it's called the body of Christ, the church age, the body of Christ. Okay, this is something that's big because nobody was in the body of Christ before, before Christ died, buried, rose again. You know the gospel. That's why some things that are in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which we're going to see, some things in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are different than Paul's doctrine. That's why one of the first, one of the main important things after you get saved and, and understand, you know, receive Lord Jesus Christ. You got to be familiar with Paul's writings, okay? And uh, we're going to look at some differences here in, in a minute. But look at a good verse here about, you know, are you saved? Okay, look at Mark, Mark chapter eight, verse thirty-six. Mark chapter eight, verse thirty-six. And this is something that people really got to really hide. This verse. This is something we, we should memorize. This verse. Matter of fact, we will. This will be. This will be verse memorization for next week. What is it? Mark what? 8, Mark 8, 36. We'll, we'll message Dave, tell him to get Debbie to print out some handouts or something like that. We're going to memorize this verse. This is a great verse. Um, what's, look what it says here. For what shall it profit a man? What re, you know, People are always interested in the return on investment. I'm going to put so much money in on this investment. In return, and I'm going to get something back. Everybody wants to make a profit. I mean, you know, you get, who doesn't want to make a profit, really? You know, what shall what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Well, the answer is, what's what's he going to profit? The the Bible says the wages wages of sin is death. You're going to die. And then you read the book of Revelation. It says this, this is the second death. Whosoever was not found in the book of life. It's cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. The old expression is, you know, born what? Born once, born once. Everybody's born once. Well, you die twice. But if you're born twice, you're only going to die once. Okay? You know, you, but you, you have to get born again. That's what Jesus talks about. And then verse, uh, verse 37. What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Whosoever there... Therefore shall be ashamed of me in my words. Now look at this. In this adulterous and sinful generation. And every time the, the word words show up in the Bible, I always circle that. Because whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me in my words. Well, if we don't have his words, then, you know, how are we ever going to be ashamed for not keeping them or not? God, Jesus Christ ain't going to tell us, you know, if a man love me, he will keep my words if we don't have his words. You know, very it's common sense, really. In this, adult, in this adulterous and sinful generation, we live in a day and age where nowadays we have to stick to God's word more than, more than ever. You know, you hear about that thing, people wanting to kill a kid, killing a baby, after not only up to the nine months or whatever, after it's you know, still in the womb, but they want to they give birth and, and to kill this thing ten months later. Ten months later, after it's, a, after it's already a child, you know, like it's like, you know, you could take the thing back and stuff like that. Oh, I don't want it, I'm tired of it, not so let's just kill it and not get charged a crime for it. These people are nuts. I mean, we're living, you talk about that, you know, wickedness, and people are, you know, people think demonic possession, you know, that's just stuff you see in the Exorcist movie, and they're spinning their heads around and vomiting all over. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a mental thing. How you doing, Ed? Thank you. It's a, it's a mental thing, a lot of the stuff. The, the, you know, for God's not giving us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. One of the first things of demonic possession is people lose their, their sound mind. They lose their sense of things. Their conscience gets seared, and it's, all, and it's downhill from there. But we live in a sinful generation, adulterous in sinful generation. Of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed. All right, now look at another one. Look at Psalms 142. Look at Psalms 142. Psalms 142. We live in such a, a generation also that's just so obsessed their their whole heart their whole affections everything that they have in them is just set on the world 
They're just so concerned with down here on earth. They have no, you know, no sense of eternity, no sense of, you know, of God, of Jesus Christ. You know, I, I, we know something that gets you thinking, something that will get you meditating on something. Read the first sentence of the Bible. In the beginning, God. And just stop there. Just think. In the beginning, God. You know? I mean, you could get there, you could say, well, God, God, where was he at? Who, who was with him? Who was next to him? Where, who was before God? And where, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. People got to, they got to think about God. Think about who he is. You know, he's righteous. He's, he's, uh, he's holy. He's just. Think on God. Now, look at, we're going to look about our soul here. Look at Psalms 142. Look at verse, uh, verse 4. It's always a big one. Always... Um, anytime I read this, it, you know, it gets to me because I, th I think about this. Look at Psalm 142, verse 4. I looked on my right hand, and beheld there was no man that would know me. Refuge failed me. Look what David says. No man cared for my soul. And I cried unto thee, O Lord. Thou art my refuge and my portion on the land of living. Has anybody ever felt like that before? No man has cared for my soul. I mean, I sure did. When I, especially after getting saved, and I appreciate now that I'm saved. Now I know for well, shadow doubt where I'm going when I die. No man cared for my soul. Going in high school, you know, getting in, you know, getting brought around with, with friends and stuff like that, and you know, oh, we had we, we had good time and stuff. And, and what do you mean good time? We were so we were into the world. That's not good time. I could have died at it so many times and went that and went to hell. What shall I profit a man gain the whole world and lose his own soul? No man cares for my soul. Think about how many people actually care for your soul. You know, I, I thank God. I, you know, my mom, my grandma, you know, I, even family members. Some family members could care less about your soul. It's a good thing you have a praying mother, a praying father, a praying family, somebody, you know, look at, look at Timothy. You know, that grandmother and thy mother, that grandmother Lois and thy, and thy mother Eunice. You know, Paul actually, Paul, uh, he pointed out those two people. Because we need we need a people we need to generate we need some people that care for people's souls, and you look around how how many people do you do you care for people's souls? You should, and if you don't, we'll pray that that God stirs you up to get a to get a burden for souls instead of looking people like a bunch of fleshy you know just fleshy creatures or whatever. Look at them as that they have an eternal soul. They're an eternal being. They're gonna go. They're gonna go somewhere. They're gonna go to heaven or they're gonna go to hell. That's scientific. Hell tells you there's molten nickel and molten lava and stuff like that in the heart of the earth. Bible's, Bible's way ahead of them. Jesus said that 2,000 years ago. In the belly of, in the belly of earth, there's a, a, a molten fire, okay, hell fire. And that, that don't get preached on these days. They want to hide that and stuff so people could live comfortably. Because wouldn't when it, when it stir you up? How, how can I live comfortably when I know that there's people going to blow our feet right now burning in hell and stuff? You have to care for people's souls. And that's why it's a blessing, you know. It's, it's a good thing. It's good to see Phil, Josh, JP. It's good to see some friends. I don't know how long you guys known each other. You know, you met one of my childhood friends, Joey Tavella. You met him. You met another one. You met Dan. He, you know, you come in and come around every here and there. You know, those, those people, you know, spend a lot of time with them. And then when you, and afterward you get saved, you know, and you try to, you try to reach out, try to, you know, win them to Christ, show them what the Lord has done for you, show them what the Lord, how the Lord changed your life. It shows that you really care for them. Those are true friends. You know, I don't care about a true friend thinking, you know, yeah, you know, you got my back, you know, you're going to stick up for me, and, you know, you're going to do this, you're going to do that, and I got your back, I'll be there when you need me and all this. You could do all that, and then yet, you know, not be concerned about your friend's souls. You know, that's a big one. You know, and I don't, there's a lot of good lost, you know, in a good, in quotations, decent lost people out there that help you. You need a hand, I'm there. You know, you can rely on them actually in a sense. But when you think about all those favors and stuff that they do, get them the gospel somehow. Show them, look, you know, there's more than this, just this life and stuff. You know, that's, that's a big one. The Bible says, no man cared for my soul. You don't get it in school. You don't get it from your, your professors, your teachers. You don't get it from many people. You know, so praise the Lord. If you got people that care for your soul, well, amen for that. Now, look at, um, let's come to the book of Matthew chapter chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. 
Now, I want to talk about, you know, what's it mean to be saved? You know, you ever hear that question? You know, ain't that something, you know, you, most people never even ask that question. They never even ask that question, really, just, just going about their life. Are you saved? Okay, so what's that, what's that mean? Are you saved? Now, the definition of saved, I went up to Webster's 1828 Dictionary, and it says, preserved from evil, injury or destruction, kept frugally, kept frugally, prevented, spared, taken in time. All right, now what I think of that is being saved is having the privilege of being spared from destruction. That's what I'd sum it up to be. It's, it's having the privilege of being spared from, from destruction, being saved from something. Okay, so let's look at Matthew chapter 10 here. Matthew chapter 10, look at verse, look at verse 22. Matthew chapter 10, look at verse 22. Now we're going to look at now we're going to look at the Bible dispensationally here for a minute. Okay, now what that means, that's a that's a Bible term. You're going to hear it over and over again. Dispensation, and all that means is God dispenses certain truths to certain individuals at a certain time period. That's something that, that you got to understand, or else you're never going to get the Bible. You might you, listen. You imagine if I just took the whole entire Bible and just tried applying it to me, you couldn't. You'd be contradicting yourself left and right. You know. Well, what are we wearing diverse colors for? How come we're not partaking in animal sacrifice? How come we're not following certain dietary laws? How come we're not observing certain um, spiritual laws? And, and how come we're in a room and not a tabernacle or a temple and stuff? So all the Bible's written you know, for us. We could read it and get something from it, but it's not written to us doctrinally, meaning you know, what, who, who is it teaching, to when is it, you know, to, uh, when is it saying this, to, and to whom it's addressing and stuff. That's something you got to get. So look, let's look at a case of that. Look at Matthew chapter 19, or Matthew chapter 10. Look at verse number uh, 21. Let's start at verse 21. Look at this. This is uh, Jesus Christ is uh, saying this here. And the brother shall deliver up the brother to death. The brother shall deliver up the brother to death. You know, thank God I don't got no brothers or sisters. <laughs> I don't got to worry about that one. No, but really, the, the brother shall deliver the brother up to death. I could, I could look at it, you know, saved even or whatever, you know. And here in this case, it's talking about there's a Jewish, there's Jewish uh, um, in, uh, context in here. Um, and the brother shall deliver up the brother to death. And just, just like Cain killed and knocked Abel over the head or killed him or whatever. And look at this. And the father, the child, and the children shall rise up against their parents. Well, you could take that practically. Kids, that's what people want to do nowadays. People don't want to listen to their parents and stuff like that. They don't want to... It's, things are getting so flipped opposite. The wife is going to roll over the husband. The children are going to roll over the parents. That's not how it's supposed to be, you know. Uh, the, the church has more of a say in things than the head of the church, which is Jesus Christ. Uh, we'll do things our way. We've got to keep up with the times, and we've got to compromise and lower our standards, and we're not going to do things a good old-fashioned way, you know. Uh, like like the Bible says, you know, they, uh, they shall give they shall give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, and uh, for there will come a time when they will not endure sound doctrine. There will come a time when they will not endure sound doctrine. So quit preaching it. <laughs> Is that what he says? He don't say that. He says, but you know, you continue to stand. You know, you got to stand for the truth. Just because people don't endure and put up with it, you got to continue to preach the truth, regardless if it offends people or not. But you do see some twisting and turning. The children shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But he that endureth to the end shall be saved. All right, now you say, what's up with this? Who is he talking to? Now this is before the cross, it's before his death, burial, and resurrection. Who's Jesus' ministry primary, primarily to? This is a little, a little bit of meteor things here. Jesus Christ said, I am not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He said, go not unto the Gentiles. Now, what's a Gentile? Anybody that isn't a Jew. Okay, so before here, he's talking to Jews, and he's actually warning them of a time period that's going to happen way out here. Jews are going to get persecuted, start delivering up and betraying one another and stuff. And a certain group of people literally has to endure to the end. A, a specific time frame, which is where you, you study the Bible, it's called the time of Jacob's trouble or the seven-year tribulation. That's in the future, okay? 
So in that case right there, you could see there's a group of people getting saved from destruction, saved from persecution. If they endure to the end, they're going to you know, literally enter into the millennial kingdom, the thousand year reign of Christ and stuff. Let's look at Matthew chapter 24. Let's look at another case about being saved. Now keep in mind, all the Bible, the Bible teaches, you know, this, the people will call this heresy and stuff like that. The Bible definitely teaches different ways to get saved. That's called dispensational salvation. And I believe in that. Okay, the way that I'm saved today is nothing like how they were saved back in any other dispensation. That's not like how they're going to be saved during this time period. How to get saved in a thousand year reign, different than where we're at. That's why I started off on 1 Corinthians 15. That's how we get saved, okay? But we, we got this self-centered attitude. We take the Bible and we think it's just, it's all for, it's just all for me. Well, not so. God has a different, a different uh, um, way of dealing with the Jewish people. You've got to uh, really understand the Jews when it comes to Bible study also. You've got to understand the importance of Israel. Um, you know, if, if, if you're ever the, ever the pick a side, you know, in politics or whatever, you hear anybody knocking on a Jew, well, stick up for the Jew. Always stick up for the Jew. You know, bless, bless, God will bless them that, that bless the Jew, and he's going to curse them that curse the Jew. Well, what's the big deal about the Jew? Well, think about it. Jesus Christ was born of a Jew, right? So if, if the Jews battling the Palestinians, the, the Arabs, who am I going to side with? I'm going to side with the Jewish people. God, had, God chose the Jewish people to give us a book. <laughs> if it wasn't for the Jews, I wouldn't, have, I wouldn't, wouldn't know anything. You know, I wouldn't know anything about my Savior. And all, a lot of the Jews wrote the Bible and stuff like that. So just, just something to note uh, simply that, that God has certain ways of dealing with the Jewish people. Now let's fast forward to Matthew chapter 24. Look at verse number, let's see, look at verse number, uh, my, verse number 13. Same thing here. Look what he says. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Did you see that? He that endures unto the end, the same shall be saved. And look at verse 14. In this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness. There's your Jehovah's Witnesses. Yeah, hey, come down to the kingdom hall. You ever heard anybody know about Jehovah's Witnesses at all? Anybody? They, they, they worship in a, and they, they call it the kingdom hall. And they preach the gospel of the kingdom. Okay? Um... And, and listen, this gospel, and that's why the Bible is a deceptive book. When you really think of it, you could, you know, the Bible is a two-edged sword. You could cut your own neck if you read the Bible wrong. I mean, it's like, it's a, you know, Dr. Ruckman would always say it's like a bear trap. You know, this thing is like you could really get yourself in a, a lot of trouble, or get yourself in a big mess for taking verses out of context and out of, and out of, uh, out of dispensations and stuff. The gospel of the kingdom well, what's that? What's the gospel of the kingdom? There's three different gospels. Hold your hand here. This is something to know. Okay, there's the gospel of the kingdom. There's no mention of the death, burial, and resurrection. Now, for definition of that, you don't got to turn there, but you, when you think of the kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, you know what Jesus Christ said? He says, for repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And I always think right away, because most people would know this, is when the Lord says, pray after this manner, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, uh, thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So the kingdom of heaven is something that's on earth. So there's a gospel, the gospel of the kingdom, okay? That's one gospel. There's the gospel of the grace of God, which we read first off. That's another, way, that's another thing that's called that was delivered to Paul. Now look at Revelation chapter 14. Look at Revelation chapter 14. Look at Revelation chapter 14. Look at verse number 6. That's why it's important. The Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, you've got to study. And then it says at the latter part of that verse that you've got to rightly divide the word of truth. So you've got to divide. Okay, this verse goes here. This verse is talking to this people. This verse is talking to those people. This verse is in the past. This verse is in the present. This verse is in the future. Okay, it's about as simply as I could say it. So look at Revelation 14. Look at verse number 6. I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, 
having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, saying, saying, so here's the declaration of this gospel, with a loud voice, fear God, that, all right, give Him glory, you could say that'd be number one, for the hour of His judgment is come. Well, okay. The hour of His judgment is come, and worship Him, I'd be probably the third part of it, worship Him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of water. Now, if you believe that gospel today, that's not what saves you. Ain't that deceptive? Well, it's in the Bible. What do you mean? <laughs> what do you mean don't say? You've got to get the things in order. You've got to rightly divide. You've got you to know, well, things, are, things that are different, they're not the same. More common sense. What, how in the world am I ever going to reconcile that verse in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4? I mean, really, I mean, is that, okay? One says Christ died for my sins, was buried, rose again the third day. This one says it's preached from an angel from heaven. Yeah, that would make sense of how it's preaching all around all the world. You know, it's got preached around the whole world. You know, um, if it's preached from an angel from heaven, and it's saying different things. You know, that you, you, you can't preach that gospel under today, just as you can't preach the kingdom. You know, the kingdom's coming, the kingdom's coming. That's not, that's not what saves you, okay? That saves a group of people in the future. Now, for those of us that studied the pre-tribulation rapture, that's one of the biggest proofs right there that a, that a Christian, a person of the body of Christ, is going to get raptured before the time of Jacob's trouble. Because you can't have two Gospels preached under the same dispensation. It would be, it'd be completely contradictory. And um, Paul says, If any man preach another Gospel, let him be accursed. If an angel from heaven preach another Gospel, let that thing be accursed. Well, that shows you that Christians are gone. For that gospel that, that saves us is gone, and God goes back to dealing with another two other groups of people, the Jews and the Gentiles. Okay, now that's a little bit of heavier stuff there. Now, um, come back to uh, Matthew chapter 19. There are certain group of people that are going to have to endure to the end to be saved. I think I, I think God. I don't got to endure to know. End. People say you know they they twist it and say well you got to endure to the end of your life and you got to hang on to the faith and you got to die in a state of grace. Did any, do I have any Catholics in here? Ex-Catholics? Jordan, amen. I mean, you know, if you have any know anything about Catholicism, one of the things they teach is you got to die in a state of grace. You know, if you're on your deathbed in Catholicism, you got to call that priest. They got to come over, they got to say 50 Hail Marys. They got to did you did you do your tithing? Make sure you tithe, you know, you know, make sure you pay me. Make sure your, your family's come and do mass and make sure you do this and do that and do that. Uh, they, they call it, you know, and if you did all that, okay, you might have squeaked into heaven. There's no assurance. There's no assurance of salvation in the Catholic religion. Nor is there any assurance of salvation in any other religion, okay? And, and nothing else. You know, that, uh, that, that assurance that I, where I know where I'm going without a shadow of a doubt because what I'm trusting in. It's by faith, okay, in the gospel. Okay, look at... Uh, Let's look at Matthew 19. Now, uh, I just want to note some things here. Well, we should look at it. Look at 2 Timothy first, real quick. Because what we've been doing so far is we've been doing rightly dividing the Scriptures. 2 Timothy 2.15. 2 Timothy 2.15. Look what it says here. After you get saved, this is one of the greatest verses. You've got you to memorize this one. Not only you got to memorize it, it's one thing just knowing it in your head and, yeah, I could spit off all these facts and I know all this, but you got to really apply these verses. You know, you gotta, you got to apply this. 2 Timothy 2.15 says study. All right, well, ain't that something the King James Bible is the only Bible to tell you to study the Bible? I mean, that's another one. You know, not do diligence or... May, well, one of them says make an effort. You know, make an effort. You know, they want to be kind of nice, you know, I guess in a way or whatever. It's a straight-up commandment that tells you to study. That's why I think it's funny. You go, what am, why am I going to go to a Bible study where I pick up any other Bible and it don't even tell me to study? The word study is taken out of it. Because obviously if you, if you study the, the Bible issue, you'll find out there's a lot of things wrong with, um, with all those translations and stuff. So look what it says. It says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. You know how many Christians are ashamed? Because they don't know what, oh, I don't know. I don't know the book. I don't know well, don't you know Jesus drank wine? And don't you know David was a homosexual? And don't you know that, that David raped Bathsheba? I've been hearing that one. 
Don't you know David rape, you know, from all these these political people that are up there and are preaching with a mask on and deck, you know what I'm saying? Like all these crazy radical, like radical people. You gotta study your book and you can't you gotta you gotta give an answer. You gotta know what you believe and why you believe it. Cause I'm you know what I used to tell my mom and grandma all the time, now nah, you just tell me. You just tell me. I was so lazy. Now I would come for dinner and stuff, and I'd just do my own thing. I got to focus on school. I got to focus on work. I got to focus on, you know, getting a life together and stuff. What am I going to do? And, you, and they, they, they tell me the Bible. They keep telling me. And I was interested. You know, people, you know, the Bible's interesting and stuff. But I'm like, I don't, I don't got the time. I don't got the time to read and things. But you got time to do all kinds of other stuff. You got all kinds of recreational time. You know, and it was deceptive because I found out my mom and grandma were telling me things that were contrary to the Word of God. And thank, praise the Lord, I had to correct them and say, look, this is wrong. You know, this is just flat out wrong. So you got to study, all right, so that you don't get ashamed. It's work. you got to put the time in. And it says, rightly divide the Word of Truth. So that's what we're doing. So come back to Matthew, rightly dividing the Word of Truth. You know, you gotta, you got to look at the Bible. It's okay. It's talking about the past, the present, the future. It's talking about different groups of people. And, and it, it takes a little. It takes some time. You know, pe people want a fast food type of religion, a fast food Bible study. Just tell me everything, put the bullet points in, and get the PowerPoints out, and just give me the gist of it, and I'll be on my way. You know, that's, that's, that's not good. Sometimes I get convicted of that. I try to cram in all this stuff, and I'm like, i got to slow down. You know, I'm trying to cram in... For, Stuff that took me uh, months to learn, try to cram a thing in, thing in an hour and a half hour study or something. There's no way. You know, we gotta slow things down and take your time and study these things. America, we're so we're so fast paced and stuff. You got no time for meditation on the word and stuff. Look at Matthew 19 though. I'll show you another difference. Look at Matthew 19. Matthew 19. Look at verse. Uh, look at verse 16. Look at Matthew chapter 19, look at verse 16. Check this one out. And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? Now look what the Lord says. Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandment. That would be a good example of Jesus Christ humbling himself, taking upon the form of a servant, okay, showing his... His, uh, his humanity, in a sense. I right, know what he says. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. Can you imagine that? Look at verse 18. He saith unto him which? Jesus said, Thou shalt do no murder. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Honor thy mother, honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Look what this guy says. The young man saith unto him, All these things have I kept from my youth up. What a liar. What lack I yet? Jesus said unto him, Look at this. He, the Lord knew this guy, this, this young, rich young roller's heart. Look at it. If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. Look at this guy. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful. He went away crying like a baby because he knew, I got to get rid of my car. I got to get rid of my car. I got to get rid of my house. I got to get rid of my, my clothes. I got to get rid of my jewelry. I got to get rid of all, all the stuff that I got, all the stuff I worked hard for. You mean, tell me, Lord, I got to get rid of this stuff? You know, I earned this stuff. And I, what do you mean? I got to get rid of it. I got to sell it and give it to the poor. Can you imagine if that message was being preached right now? You know, sell all that you have, okay? Sell all that you have and go ahead and give it to the poor. And come and, follow, and come and follow me. He went away very sorrowful. Now look at verse 23. Verse, uh, verse 23. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you that a rich man shall hardly enter into the what? Into the kingdom of heaven. And this is a little, we're getting a little deeper stuff here now. Yeah, it's going to be impossible for a rich man to be saved in that tribulation period. Read the book of James. Because there's going to come a time where the Bible talks about a mark of the beast. It talks about a one-world currency system. They're already trying to do that right now. You know, it's no wonder why they're going to, you know, 
uh, print out all this money, pass out all these checks. Eventually, the goal of all of this, you know, we talk about people here from work and all that. The goal of all of this is, and I'm not getting sick and tired of even hearing about it. I'm like, look, don't you, you know, you, they're, they're Christians. I praise the Lord. I work, for some, I work for a good Christian and stuff. This is in the Bible. This stuff, a lot of this stuff is, you know, it, it, it's told us is going to happen. You know, but what, what are we going to do? You know, everybody's saying, you better get your guns ready. You better you know, get fighting and all that. Look, they want to come at me. They, they're going to come at me. Okay, I might get off a couple shots or two, whatever. <laughs> and that'd be the end of me. You know, I don't got much of a chance of all this. All I got, all I could do is just preach the truth. Tell them, look, our, our government's going to fail us. Our money's going to fail us. All this stuff's going to collapse. Yeah, Jesus said it's going to be imp it's going to be impossible. Pretty much, you have a better chance of a camel going into an eye of a needle than a rich man to be saved and to enter into the what? Into the kingdom of heaven. Because over here. Imagine that. You, you, your whole your bank account gets wiped out. We're, we're transforming ourselves into a new form of currency. And, um, and people go, and, and, and if you don't got that currency, you're going to be dirt poor. You don't got the mark of the beast in the tribulation, you'll be dirt poor. So he, and he, he's pretty much aiming, you know, he's aiming at that time period, really. Um, now look at verse 24. Again, I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. That's, that's like impossible. Then for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. When, now, okay, for, for Bible students in a sense, the only time the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God is on earth is when a Jesus Christ comes back. So sometimes you'll see those are used synonymously. Kingdom of heaven, most time it's physical, political, uh, rulership on planet earth of Jesus Christ. And the kingdom of God is most of the time spiritual. But sometimes those two kingdoms come together. When? Okay, when, uh, when the king is literally reigning the earth, a thousand year reign, and he's dwelling with the body of Christ, and the, and the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven are in one. Okay? That's just that's something to get there. Then look at verse 25. When his disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed. And look what they said, saying, Who then can be saved? Okay? Who then can be saved? Um, now look at this. But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, With men, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Then look what Peter says. Then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all. And I was like Peter. He was always right there on the spot. He's listening to the Lord. You know, he, you know he's, 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 sometimes he, you know, he, he jumps the gun too quick and he says something foolish and stupid like, like we all do and all that. But... But here, Peter, look what he says here. He says, Behold, we have forsaken all. I'm just reading the book of Matthew again. And immediately, Jesus went over to Peter and his brother, and they, they left their dad. They left their father. They left their job. And said, Yeah, we'll go follow you. A guy they never met before. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I mean, you imagine how hard that would be? I'm just going to drop, I'm going to drop my, my family. I'm going to drop, you know, Peter, you don't hear much about it, about his wife. You don't hear, you know, w w what's going on? You know, you're just going to drop everything. I've forsaken all and, and, and followed thee. What shall we have, therefore? You know, a little self-centered. What, what, what shall we have? You know, what, what are you going to give us? That was, but that was rightfully, I believe Peter had a right to say that. In verse 28, And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory. We studied this verse before. Um, ye shall sit upon the twelve thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. That's a pretty big, pretty big promise. He says, look, Peter, you did all this for me. Here's your inheritance when, you get, when, my, when, my, when I come back uh, during the kingdom, the regeneration, when God restores the, the whole earth and stuff. The United Nations ain't going to restore the earth. You know, forget about them. The Environmental Action Protection Agency, you know. The, what, what gets me, you, we, you, people care more for a bald eagle egg. If I go out and kick a bald eagle egg and step on a bald eagle and break its neck and shoot it because it's flying over my yard or whatever, I go to jail for that? Yeah, I'm going to go to jail if I kill a, kill a baby? I mean, when, when people take animal rights over top of the rights of, a, you know, an unborn life or whatever, you got to be sick. You're like a, you're like a, a, a baboon. You're like a barbarian. Trying to you're like an animal, you know, it's crazy. Um, anyways, look at verse 29. And everyone that hath forsaken houses, or brethren, or sisters, 
or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my name's sake shall receive a hundredfold. That's a lot. A hundredfold. Remember we studied the rewards? Hundredfold, I think sixtyfold, and I think thirtyfold or something like that. Some people will inherit different things, your inheritance and stuff, Jordan. When it says a hundredfold, is that safe to say like a times one hundred or it's like a whole like Yeah, I mean I I'm not too I I, I look at it like that. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know exactly what I I think of it right away, like like times a hundred. Yeah. Okay. The fold, I don't know what, what that could be. Um but then and shall inherit everlasting life. But it's interesting to note that what listen. There's a difference between inheritance, okay? Now, it's interesting how, notice how he said you will inherit eternal life. So the things that we do for the Lord Jesus Christ right now, you better, you better believe God's going to dish out the, the due recompense of reward. And all that simply says is, look, you, you're, you're doing labor for me. You're working for me. You're, you're going to, you know, let's break it, make it worldly. You're going to get a paycheck when you get up to heaven. You'll get a reward. You know, and that's why we study the judgment seat of Christ, how God's going to try our service. So ask yourself, what in the world have you done for the Lord Jesus Christ after you were saved? You know, yeah, I got saved and, you know, I just kind of stuck in the world. I, you know, can, can you at least forget about the filthy music that you listen to? Could you at least forget about the video games and the stupid wasting time? You know, I'm, playing, I'm going to play some video games. Grow up. You know, well, I, 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 there's going to come a time where, you know, Paul says, I... You know, I become a man, I put away childish things. One of these days, you have to put away childish things, you know. Quit playing the video games, quit listening to filthy music, quit watching stupid stuff on television, and, and you know, try to do something for the Lord. Try to buy that time back, redeem the time that you were out, you know, killing your brain cells and stuff and doing stupid things. Get that time back, redeem that time, you know. And God's going to pay you back. And he told Peter, yeah, you, you're going to have a part thousand, two thousand years later. <laughs> You know, and Peter, look, Peter, he was, he was content with it. I love, I, more as look at Peter, I, I love Peter, man. I love, I love to see his growth. You know, you were reading first, first Peter and second Peter. You wouldn't know that, that a fisherman wrote that. A fisherman, you know, a guy that was like at the base of all things and in the spiritual insight that that guy had in those epistles. Phew. I mean, it's amazing. All right, let's look at, um, Let's look at another one, talking about being saved. Look at uh, Luke 1. Luke 1. Luke chapter 1. Here's another, here's another uh, instance. Saved. All right? Are you saved? All right? Now, some of this stuff isn't talking about you. Some of this stuff is a Bible study. We're talking about, you know, talking about the Jews, talk, talking about the disciples, and talking about, you know, certain periods of time and different groups of people and things. Um, let me look at another one. Look at Luke chapter 1. Look at verse 67. Here's an interesting verse here. Look at Luke chapter 1. Look at verse uh, 67. Luke chapter 1. Look at verse 67. The birth of Jesus Christ. Alright, look at it. Then his father, Zacharias, was filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied, saying... Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people, and hath raised up a horn of salvation for us, the Jews, in the house of his servant David, as he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began. You know the first prophecy of Jesus Christ is in the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 3. You know, I will put enmity between thy seed and and her seed. Well, a woman don't got seed. So right away there's a, there's a prophecy since the world began of a virgin birth. A woman don't got no seed. You know, you got to think about that. Well, that's good. The, the, how, how did God of the universe, he threw out all these planets and tossed out all these stars and all this. How did he decide to come into his creation through a little tiny seed? I think that's brilliant. You know, he could have, to, to be like a man, to be, you know, to understand what it's like to suffer. I always say that. What in the world do I have in common with Allah or, or Buddha or Ramakrishna and all these gods? You don't got nothing in common with them. That's why God, he, he came down fashioned in the likeliness of, of, of man. God manifested in the flesh, Jesus Christ. All right, now, as he's from the world began, look at verse 71. Now, look at this. This is in the Jewish 
uh, a Jewish point of view, let's think of this. Verse 71. That we should be saved from our enemies. All right, so there's an instance, you know, saved. Saved from our enemies, okay? But this is the Jews saying this. And from the hand of all, of our, all that hate us, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. Now, you want to see, that's one of the main reasons right there why, why Jews reject Jesus Christ. Because what do you mean? He never did that. Do you see, you, you see that, that line of thinking? He was going to come to save us from all of our enemies. And yet, Rome, you know, we're, we're still paying tax to Rome and, you know, the Jews people. He, and Rome's still rolling over us. And, you know, we, we barely, we don't even got our land and stuff that God promised us. He made a promise to Abraham way back in the day. You know, so you can see from a Jewish mindset, this is what they were expecting their Messiah to be. But there's going to come a, a day and time where God's going to make all of his enemies like his footstool. My Lord saith unto my Lord, sit thou at my thy right hand till thy make thy enemies thy footstool. You know, imagine the Lord just kicking up his feet on a bunch of enemies and stuff. When's that? That's at the, you, you got to get down the first coming and second coming. Okay? It's important. So there, there, there's the Jews looking for being saved from enemies. Okay? Then you study the Apostle Paul's ministry. God don't ever promise to save us from enemies <laughs> today. Matter of fact, you're going to have a lot of enemies. You have a lot of persecution, tribulations in various ways or whatever. So, you know, th things are different. People think, well, I'm going to get saved. Then God's going to get rid of all my enemies. He's going to make sure my health is okay. He's going to, you know, if he does that, amen. If he doesn't do it, amen. Okay, so it's good enough that my soul's saved. Okay, so, you know, pra praise the Lord for that. And I'm eternally secure and stuff like that. Now let's look at... Uh, Let's see. Let's look at Luke 18. That's, that's another instance of being saved. Okay. Look at, uh, look at Luke. Luke 18.42. I had that verse, Luke 19.27, but we, we read it when we studied the millennium. When the Lord says, take my enemies and slay them before me. Remember that pretty wild, extreme verse, you know. Well, that's going to, and when's that being fulfilled? During the millennium. So um, that's, that's one thing when he's going to deliver the Jewish people from their enemies. But anyways, look at uh, Luke 18.42. I'm going to talk about saved from blindness. Luke 18.42. And Jesus said unto him, Receive thy sight. Thy faith hath saved thee. Ain't that, ain't that nice? That was a good little nugget. What, say, what saves, you know, what saved that guy? Well, his faith, you know. Now, don't get, now don't get carried away because there's, there's a lot of, you know, it's the charismatic movement and all this is what it's called. The charismatic, all, they, all that word is charisma. You know, they're charming people and, uh, you know, they know how to, to work the crowd and get everybody, you know, their goosebumps and tingling and fleshy and all this, you know, all that stuff. And they, they're, they're so big. They're a bunch of fakers. I don't know if anybody ever seen that stuff before. You know, they touch them and they fall over and they fall on the ground and they start rolling over and, you know, just crazy stuff. I'm going to heal you from... Look, listen, God can heal. I believe that God could take away things and do miracles, but God don't, you know, God don't work through no person, you know, like a guy in Pittsburgh, I think his name's Billy Burke, okay? If you guys want to get healed from your, you know, your bad hip or bad back, go down and see Billy Burke at the convention center, and, you know, and, and he'll hear you, heal you and stuff. It's a bunch of phony stuff. Okay, you know, God, God, the power of healing, the gift of healing, he'd be out walking the streets of, of wherever. And why do I got to go to him? You know, the Lord's going around searching for people and getting them healed. You have to talk about the power of healing there, but not to get into a whole big uh, teaching on that. But what I look at, I look at Ephesians chapter 5, uh, Ephesians 5. You know, saved from, that guy was saved from literal blindness. The Lord restored his sight. All right, amen to that. Look at look at uh, Ephesians four or Ephesians five fourteen. Um, Ephesians five fourteen. Um, I know there's a better one. I don't know. I probably wrote down the wrong reference. But Ephesians five. Ephesians. Uh, well, what am I? That's I'm in Ephesians four. That's right. Ephesians five. Fourteen. There you go. Here's something that we can be saved from. I believe we could be saved from spiritual blindness. 
Okay, look at look at uh, Ephesians chapter five verse fourteen. Wherefore he saith, Awake, thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See, then I like how he says that. You know, like he infers that everybody, you guys, are a bunch of blind people. You don't, you don't, you don't see the the things that, the way that God sees it. You don't, you know, you don't hear the way that God hears and stuff. It's all about yourself and all that. He says, then he says, See then that ye walk circumspectly. All right, you know what that means? That's cautious. All right? That's watchfulness every way with guard. That you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Well, how do you do that? Redeeming the time because the days are evil. All right, now that's, a, that's a great verse. Redeeming the time. Get back that time because the days are evil. Try to do what you can to walk with the Lord. All right, look at, um, now let's see here. Let's look at, uh, um, let's look at John chapter 3. John chapter 3. I'm going to have to wrap this thing up here in a little bit. John chapter 3. All right, John chapter 3. I'm going to just go through a couple verses here. Um, what are, okay, now what are we saved from? Okay, what are we saved from? Now, part of that question when you ask somebody, you know, are you saved? The main thing that we're saying is, are you saved from hell? Okay? Now, that's a whole big thing because a lot of Christians nowadays, they don't even believe in that. Don't, you know, it don't matter about what you believe. The Bible talks about it. And it don't matter if it rubs you the wrong way or whatever. We've got to preach it and teach it. We're to believe in that. If there was no hell, if there was no hell on, pl on earth... What, what is the church for? Some, you know, a big psychiatric building or something like that to just help people out. No, you know, if there was no hell, we're wasting our time too. Um, you know, that, that's a that's a that's crazy. But people preach that. Christians will write books against against you know because God loves God. A loving God will never send anybody to hell. It's against His character. He loves you so much, and they got the right tone of voice, and they're so soothing, and you know. Um, all that stuff. It's like, no, okay, there is a hell, regardless of whatever you say. Now, look at John. Look what he says here. John 3, 16. Um, well, might as well, yeah, 3, 16 and 17. Um, okay, yeah, here we go, the, through 18. For God so loved the world, and he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life, whosoever. All right, so for us that have studied Calvinism, well, there's a good one too. Whosoever. The atonement is made available to anybody that believes and receives it. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. He that believeth on Him is not condemned, but he that believeth not, look at this, is condemned already. It's a great verse for people to say, oh, you know, you're condemning me, you're condemning me. The Bible already says you're condemned already. No matter what, any, what any more that I can say, okay? You're already condemned. That's the whole point why. And this is the condemnation. That light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. It's one of the, ver one of the great verses on why people reject the light. Why do people, why would people reject that the gospel of salvation and what God did for me, because they 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 love they hung on to the world they loved on to their I'd rather have things in the world I'd rather continue to have pleasure in my sin and stuff than to you know God because that's their thing God forbid you know I like what Paul says you know ye that despise the calling of God and the calling of God for every Christian's life is to is to be holy to clean up your life he says that you you know you don't despise me in a sense but you despise God. You know, people don't want to get, they don't want to get right because they want to hang on to the pleasure of their sin. And if you're truly saved, you're genuinely born again, God of the universe comes down and dwells inside of you, you're going to have to take orders from somebody that's new, that you're not used to listening to. Okay? That's what the Bible says. You've got two natures, the old man and the new man. And when the new man moves in to the old man, what happens? There's, but, there's button heads now. You know what I mean? You got like the, the, these are the one; these are contrary one to another. Flesh warth against the spirit, and they don't agree. So that's why you got to put down the flesh. You got to do whatever you can in your power and the power of the Holy Spirit and help of God to 
help you get victory over your over your flesh, okay? And people don't want that. They want to live in their flesh, a bunch of pagans and stuff. And he said, because their deeds are evil. And then, for everyone that doeth evil, hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. He that doeth truth cometh, cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. All right, saved from, uh, let's look at Romans, Romans 10. Romans 10, or uh, Romans 5.10. Romans 5.10. Now you got to ask yourself this, you know. You got to ask yourself, you know. Um, as we continue, with, you know, we get a little bit more here. But some things about, you know, are you are you saved? You got to examine yourselves. Look at Romans five verse ten. And look, what he, look what Apostle Paul says. He says, um, "For if uh, for if we." Yeah, wait, well, I'm going to save from wrath to come. I don't want that. I want the wrath. The one which is about the wrath. That's 5.10. For if we, uh, okay, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by our life. Is that what it says? We shall be saved by his life. That's something I want you to get to. When it comes to salvation, it's all about what Jesus Christ did. You, are, you have no single part in your salvation at all. That's not how God set the thing up. He set it up that he, he was going to take the place of you, die in the sinner's place, uh, bury and resurrect the third day for the justification that he had power over death and power over hell and all that. And um, okay, So we are saved by his life, not our own life. Our own life is, is uh, it's conditioned upon are we going to live for God now? We're going to yield our, our, our members or we're going to try to serve the Lord and stuff, okay? But I like that. We're saved by His life, okay? Um, verse 11, what, how, how so? And not only so, but we, are, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ by whom we have now received the atonement. It depends upon whether or not you receive the atonement or not. Okay, you have to. That's something that you have to receive it. And I'll I'll show you a good, good passage while we're in Romans. Look at Romans chapter, uh, Romans ten. You know this is uh, this is important for re receiving it. This I always look at this passage as. You know, like a like a you're at a, it's like a marriage in a sense. Uh, there's a lot of similarities between a mar the ma a marriage, and salvation actually. And there's a lot of a lot of similarities there. And in Romans 10, look at verse number 9 through 13. I almost look at this as like, you know, the I do. It's a commitment. It's something that you, you know, and I don't believe this is a work. I don't believe that, you know, saying a prayer is a, is a work and stuff. Because then, well, where do you stop? You know, if this was a work, then Paul wouldn't have said this in his epistle, okay? Is, is breathing a work? Or is, you know, is, is reading a work? <laughs> you know, people get so lazy. You know, I'm just, you know, I'm... I'm I was walking when I got, when I just instantly just, you know, I was, well, you were walking. Wasn't that, wasn't what you working or something? You know, it's like, you get, there's a whole big argument and stuff I got about this passage. I think it's, I think it's clear though. Now look at this. I almost look at this as like a, the, a, the application of the gospel. Because one thing, you know, the, the, you know, the devils believe and they tremble. You know, and that's always a whole scary thing. Uh, the devils believe. The devils believe in a virgin birth, believe in the, the deity of Christ. They believe in the fundamentals. They believe in the inerrancy of Scripture. They believe in, um, you know, they, tr they, they tremble at God's Word. Uh, and, they, um, and they believe in, the um, obviously, that Christ died and was buried and rose again and all that. But look, look at Romans 10, verse 9. 9 through 13. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Did you, did you ever do that before? We've got to think about that. It's either you did it, and God's, God's true, and He'll save you, or that you never did it before, and you're, you're condemned already, in a sense, okay? If thou shalt confess with thy mouth, that's not all, but that's not it, though, okay? And shalt believe in thy heart. They're synonymous. You imagine, I, I, I just, I never, imagine if I never told my wife I love you. 
You know, I talk, I, I believe it though. You know, imagine if you get up to, you get up to get married and you guys just look at each other at the face and just stand there. You know, do, do you take this lofty woman to be your, you know, husband and all this, or wife or whatever? And, you know, they just, you guys look at each other. Like there's no commitment. There's no words. There's no, because the Bible says out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So if you got that, your, you got your heart tuned up and in line with God, it's, you're going to talk about it. You're going to say it. You're going to call out to the Lord. I mean, is that far-fetched? You know, I mean, think about that. Because it says, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart, they go together, what are we to believe? That God hath raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. Now, look at that. Believeth unto righteousness. Whose righteousness? God's righteousness. That's why I like that little poster in the back when, you know, you got, you got Jesus Christ sitting up there on the great white throne and you got a sinner, you know, clothed in filthy rags, dripping. I mean, that's nasty. You know, and you know what filthy rags is, is likened unto in the Bible? Self-righteousness. So when God puts up a judgment day and he sets up, all right, I provided a way to salve, you know, salvation. People, you know, you know, people say, God, he's so loving, he wouldn't send anybody to hell. You technically, in a sense, send yourself to hell for rejecting. That's the big sin right there. You flat out say, I don't want nothing to do with the gospel. God's going to say, okay, you're going to be judged. I'm going to take my righteousness, and I'm going to take your righteousness. People think, oh, he's going to judge me by my works, and if my good works outweigh my bad works. He's judging you by that perfect man whom he ordained. It talks about in the book of Acts. He's judging you by a perfect standard. How do you think your filthy, self-righteous rag is going to last when they're stacked up next alongside a perfect man? You, you know what I mean? There's no chance. That's why we believe unto righteousness, and in in part of the doctrines of salvation is God gives you His righteousness. You, you know, that's a, I always, always get a blessing from that. You know, he, he took my sins, and I got His righteousness. We talk about bargains and a deal. <laughs> Man, I, you know, we got a deal for that. You know, and the Lord bought me. He paid for me. He, he, he purchased me with his blood. It's expensive. You know, that's a, that's a blessing. Now, um, Romans 10. Look at Romans 10. Or with the heart, believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. They go hand in hand. For the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him, shall not be ashamed. And it's no doubt you believe in your heart God raised him from the dead. Out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. You're going to talk to God. You know, that's natural. A baby comes out the womb and is hungry and needs something, it just starts crying. It, it's calling, you know, it's all it can do. It's, it's calling out. It's calling out to, you know, calling out to the mother and stuff. You know, as newborn babies, we're going to call out to God. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth shall not be ashamed, for there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. The Bible says, For whosoever, Jew, Gentile, male, female, whatever, not just the elect, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You either did that or you didn't do it. Okay? Now, um, all right, another thing, look at Acts 15. We just got a couple, couple more verses here. Acts, um, Acts 15. Hang in here. Acts 15. Uh, Acts 15, look at verse number. Look at verse number one. I'm going to tell you one thing. I'm going to tell you something that, that doesn't save. Okay, so we understand the gospel saves us. The righteousness of God saves us. Um, believing in what He'd done for us, calling upon the name of the Lord, saves us. Then Acts chapter 15, all right, well, what doesn't save us? All right, well, what doesn't save us is religion. That's one of the first things I'd like to teach everybody, the difference between salvation and religion. Okay, this is a basic difference. Salvation is what God did for you. Religion is what you do for God. Okay, and that's what, that's what, how do you spot false, how do you spot, spot false religions? They all say, well, you do something for God, and you might make it to heaven, you know, 
study some religions out there. They all tell you every single religion out there has a works-based salvation. You got to do this, do that, do this to achieve enlightenment, nirvana, paradise, whatever they want to call it as their heaven or whatever. You got to do certain things. Well, right away, that's false. And that's what the devil does, though. He always takes, you know, certain truths and misplaces them. You know, like back in the day, yeah, you had to follow the law, man. You had to follow the law and you had to do all these ordinances and all this. And that's just how God set it up. You had to believe what God told you to do at that time. Now we're in the church age. That's not, so let's look at the difference here. Look at Acts 15, verse uh, 1. All right, certain men came down from Judea, taught the brethren, and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. What do you think about that? What, you should be like, what do you mean? If I have circumcised after the manner of Moses, I can't be saved? So this is a big deal here. Look at verse 2. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension in, disputa uh, in disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. And being brought to pass, they went to Phoenicia and Samaria. Uh, come down to verse 5. And there rose up a certain sect of the Pharisees which believed, but look at this, saying that it was needful to circumcise them and commanded them to keep the law of Moses. And look at verse 6. And the apostles and elders came together for to consider this matter. This matter was settled back in 52 A.D. You'd be surprised. You studied Catholicism a little bit. They had these councils, Council of Trent, Council of Nicaea, and, uh, and, and pretty much they had these councils of how are we saved? And I have Roman Catholic catechisms at home that says that anybody that believes that we're saved, how Peter tells us to be saved, is accursed. So let's get the conclusion of this council at Jerusalem, how we're to be saved. Let's look at verse 7. When there had rose up much disputed, Peter rose up and said unto men and he said unto the men and brethren, Ye know that how a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us, and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Notice that. By faith. Then look what Peter says. Peter, a re very reasonable, common sense guy. That's why I like him a lot too. Now therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples? You know what a yoke is? Like a yoke of oxen, the things that, that drives the oxen, and they're yoked up together with that thing on their neck, you know? And it, and it drives them, it controls them, okay? Why are you tempting God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear. None of our fathers could keep it. None of uh, you know, none of us could. None of us could keep the full law. What, well, then, what was the purpose of the law? It was a it was a schoolmaster to point us to Christ, to say, look, I can't keep this. I'm convicted. I'm a, I'm a felon. I'm a criminal. I need somebody to step in my place and pay and and pay for my sins. You know. So, and then look look at verse eleven. The conclusion. But we believe that through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. Now you see that? What's that? What do you see here a lot? You see belief. You see the heart. You see faith. Do you see anything about water baptism? Do you see anything about um, the sacraments or praying rosaries or lighting candles or tithing, whatever. You don't see none of that. And yet, I've, I, I, one of these days I'm going to do a study on why I'm not a Roman Catholic and really pull and get really exhaustive and pull out the catechism and stuff like this and all this because you read one of it, it says, if any man believes that justification is through faith alone, they're accursed. So the Roman Catholic Church is accursing Peter and he's accursing, look at Romans chapter 5 again. He's accur they're accursing the Apostle Paul <laughs> because look what Romans chapter 5 says. Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. 
And I'm getting a blessing from reading this book that I'm reading on about the early church and, the, and, the, and the, uh, you know, how they got the King James Bible and stuff because what these people stood for, they stood against the tyrannical, crazy, devil-possessed, demon-possessed Catholic church who was literally burning people slowly like in crazy diabolical ways because they, didn't, they, you know, they weren't a part of the mother church, which, only gives you, which salvation is only found in them. When people got a hold of the scriptures and they were reading, wait a minute, not at all. <laughs> you know, they completely, you know, that's why a, a, Rome, a good Roman Catholic, they don't, know, they don't know nothing about the Bible, really. And a priest wants to keep you in the darkness. He don't want you reading the Bible. Because then you're going to find out, oh, uh-oh, <laughs> you know, you're teaching a false plan of salvation, really. So, I'm going to wrap it up here. I'm going to be done here. Let's, I want to look at, um, all right, so... You can write down a couple other verses. Galatians 4 9, Galatians 5 1. Um, I like this verse. I do want to read this, though. 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 19. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's and read the book of Galatians. Uh, we did a verse by verse study in Galatians, and that book is so clear that we are not saved by the law and we're justified by the faith in the blood of Jesus Christ and, and justified by faith in Christ and what he did for us, not from the deeds of the law. You know, the Bible says, it talks about liberty. You know, the, you, you shall know the truth and the truth shall what? Shall set you free, okay? And the Bible, thy word is, uh, what is it? Thy word is truth. I mean, I can't think of it. John 17, 17. Sanctify them through thy word. Thy word is truth. Right? The truth shall set you free. The sun shall make you free and all that. So look at Second Peter chapter 2. And I just think it's funny because a lot of people, you know, they talk about liberty and stuff these days. You know, the, the only liberty we speak of is the liberty where, the, where I like that verse that says, where the Lord is, you know, there is liberty. Okay? You got the Lord. You got Jesus Christ. You got, you got liberty. You're, you're, you got freedom from sin, from, you know, you're free from death, from hell and all that. De death, you may die, but the grave ain't going to keep you. It'll be raptured one day. Look at 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 19. While they promised them liberty, you know, I think of America a lot, you know, li you know liberty, lady liberty. While they promised them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome of the same, is he brought in bondage? All right. Now I got a good good quote here from uh, Dr. Bob Jones Sr. I thought this was a good one. He said the greatest slaves in the world are people that talk about freedom, like politicians and everything. You know, they are, he says they are in the chains of their habits and their passions and their appetites, bound by these chains, and they talk about freedom. And you think of it, there's never been a generation that's so bound uh, by slavery than the generation today. People are such bounded by the chains of their sin, you know, and they, while they sit down and they talk and they promise people liberty, if you're not preaching the gospel, if you're not preaching about Jesus Christ and you're not preaching of, you know, the, the word of God, the truth in God's book, you're not going to get set free. You're not going to, you're not saved, okay? Um, how about, uh, let's see, let's close up with, let's see, I cl let's close with, um, let's close with 1 Timothy chapter 2, 1 Timothy chapter 2. Now, because we went over Romans chapter 10, and it's either you believe the gospel and called upon the Lord, or you have not. All right? And like we said, you know, water baptism, that does not save you. Fasting doesn't save you. Praying doesn't save you. Confirmation uh, doesn't save you. Church attendance doesn't save you. Tithing, priests, pastors, they don't save you. It's only found in the gospel. Okay? Um, and I want you to think about it. You know, there must have been a time in your life that where you acknowledged your sin. You know, there had to be some time where God was dealing with you personally about, about your sin. And, um, and I, I was looking, you, you might have been searching for God. You might have been religious. You might have been trying to pray and stuff. But when, when you search out for God and you want, to, you want to know how to get saved, He's obligated to get you the truth. Look at Second, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2. Look at verse number 4. All right, Paul writes, Who will have all men to be saved and to come 
to the knowledge of the truth. All right. Now we studied a verse last week that talked about it's it's you know the will of God for for every person in this world is to receive what He done for you. You know, and who 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 would you know? If, especially if your heart's right with God, you you know you're humble. It's hard for for rich people to get saved because they're not humble, and it's hard for you know people that are prideful to get saved because they're built up, they're they're puffed up. You know, so that's why God got to bring you low down to understand I'm a sinner, and you understand the gospel. First Corinthians fifteen one through four. You take a look at Romans. It you apply the gospel. You call upon the Lord. You get saved, okay? You might not get saved like how the you know Jews are expecting to get saved from your enemies. You might, you might not. You know, you may get you know Lord may save you from some health troubles. Amen. You might, you might not. But I think it's sufficient enough that you know as long as my soul's saved. There. How about this verse? How about First John five thirteen? First John five thirteen. Last verse. Promise. First John five thirteen. So, you know, are you saved? And that's why it's a good thing. Paul says, examine yourselves. There's only three people that know you're saved. It's either God, God knows you're saved, the devil knows you're saved, and you know you're saved. I mean, that's really it. I mean, I ask people, are you saved? you get saved? When did you get saved? And get their testimony and stuff. That's good. I could take, I'd take you at your word for it, okay? But at the end of the day, only, only God knows your hearts, you know? He knows. Did, have you trusted in what I've done for him? Did I ever hear anything from this guy at all? Did he never speak to me? Did he never say, you know, he's, he's trying your hearts. He's looking at your hearts. Now look at First John, look at First John uh, 5. Look at verse number 12 and 13. He that hath the Son hath life. He And he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Straightforward. A little baby could understand that thing. That's all one syllable words in that verse too. Verse 13. These things have I written unto you. We've got to have what John wrote, you know. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that ye may know that ye have eternal life. You get that? Do you really honestly see that? Because that's a big one. That's one of the great verses on it, assurance of salvation. That ye may, you know, don't say that you may hope you have eternal life. Or, I think I got it. I hope I got it. I might got it. No. That ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. So if you're saved, you got to be saved. you got to know you're saved. You may struggle with sin. You may struggle with getting victory over the flesh. You'll be fighting this, this carcass the rest of your life. But you're going to find out that a new man moved in. You're going to see, I, I look at things different now. You, you'll see some, you know, some evidences that you better believe, God, there's going to be something different. When a God of the universe... And dwells inside of a, a believer, you know, and it can be overnight. You know, so don't get all hypercritical on people. Oh, he's not doing. I don't think they're saved. You know, watch out. Have some grace and stuff like that. But you know, there's something. You will see something. And it all start with the inner and the inner man. A different change of outlook. I, I'm I'm hungry for the Word of God now. I desire it and stuff. And I'm gonna try to conform my thoughts to God's thoughts and all and so on. But uh, let's bow our heads for closing prayer. <clears throat> All right, dear Lord God, Heavenly Father, Lord, I just thank you for um, for your word here tonight, Lord. I thank you for just uh, just giving me the strength, Lord, and the privilege to uh, just be behind here and, and preach your book, Lord. Um, thank you for saving me. I pray, Lord, that, um, that you continue to examine everybody's hearts, Lord, and, and allow us to take this time to uh, for everybody here to look at their own hearts and, and have they received you? Are they saved? Do they know they're saved, Lord? And I pray that uh, I pray that they do get saved. I pray that they, uh, for our saved, Lord. I pray that we continue to have joy in our salvation. Uh, we live in a, a pretty crazy world. It's easy to get depressed and uh, and discouraged and stuff. But help us think on the heavenly things, Lord. Think about what you've done for us. Think about that we have a home prepared in the heavens for us, Lord, and um, set our affections above. Just be with us, Lord. Help us put our flesh down and live for you. Give you all praise and glory this evening, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. All righty, Jordan, you want to cut that down? All righty, we'll do verse.